I'm the history guy. You know, in addition to the YouTube channel, we also have a page on Patreon where for as little as a dollar a month you can subscribe and further support the work that we're doing here at the History Guy. And one of the things that you get in exchange for becoming a patron on Patreon is that we do one additional episode a month that is exclusive for our Patreon patrons. And for the last year, those have been videos regarding the hats in the History Guy's hat collection. And sometimes, like today, we're able to bring an older one of those episodes to the YouTube audience so you can see what they look Look like. If you enjoy today's episode, then please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Now, if you look at military hats, sometimes you'll notice that they will have a fancy design on the brim or the peak of the hat. And that design, it can be rather fancy. Sometimes it's glued on and sometimes it's stitched on. But uh, that's called different things in different places. The ones that are on the brim of a senior officer's hat from the U.S. Army or the Navy are sometimes referred to as scrambled eggs. That's actually an oak leaf design, but it, it looks like someone has dumped scrambled eggs on the brim of the hat is why they call it that. But the actual appropriate word for these, the title for that, is, is it's called fretting. And one of the things that is kind of interesting in the United States is that the hats of the United States Air Force have unique fretting on them. And if you can see that, that's not a leaf design. What that is, is that's clouds and lightning bolts. It's unique to the Air Force. And in the Air Force, they will refer to that fretting that is on the brim of a senior officer's hat as farts and darts if that's the piece of trivia that you didn't know for the day. But also interesting about this has that you'll see that the emblem is not actually an official Air Force emblem. The Air Force emblem is a silver version of the Great Seal of the United States. Rather, this emblem uh, represents something different. And strangely, this emblem is not an emblem for someone who's in the military. This is not an emblem for someone's in the Air Force. This is a civilian hat because this emblem belongs to the civilian auxiliary of the United States Air Force, which is called the Civil Air Patrol, and they have a history that deserves to be remembered. The Civil Air Patrol was founded on the verge of the Second World War on the basic idea that the nation's thousands of civil aviators could provide the nation a valuable service in case of war. Part of the idea was to protect civil aviation, as most nations that had entered the war had essentially shut down civil aviation, grounding all but military flights. The CAP would establish ways to utilize America's more than 150,000 civil aviators to serve the war effort rather than grounding them. They would be, essentially, flying Minutemen. In May of 1941, President Roosevelt, anticipating the coming war, established the Office of Civilian Defense. The goal of the office was to coordinate state and local efforts to protect civilians in a case of war or emergency. The office coordinated measures such as air raid warnings, shelters, and blackouts in case air raids were made on the U.S. In reality, the odds of air raids in the U.S. were slim, but the purpose was really to psychologically prepare the civilian population for war. FDR appointed the popular mayor of New York City, Fiorello LaGuardia, as the first director of the agency. A group of civil aviators and aviation enthusiasts had already come up with a plan, and they presented it to LaGuardia, who gave his enthusiastic support. LaGuardia officially established the CAP via an administrative order that was issued December 1st, but published December 8th, the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Major General John Francis Curry, an officer in the Army Air Corps, was the, appointed the director of the new organization, making him the nation's only acting general in charge of a civilian army at the time. Now this hat is a reproduction, but it does show the emblem for the Civil Air Patrol at the time. And when the war started, civil aviation was grounded in the United States, with the exception of airliners. And that, that was largely because our civil airports didn't have a lot of security. And so civil aviation offered a sabotage risk, because people, you know, flying around planes, we didn't know who they were. But when we made that decision to ground civil aviation, it actually increased enrollment in the Civil Air Patrol. Because not only was the Civil Air Patrol a way for a civil pilot to contribute to the war effort, it was really the only way that a civil aviator could fly. The CAP would play many roles during the war, but one need was particularly acute. Almost immediately after the U.S. entered the war, Germany began Operation Drumbeat and started sending U-boats to attack shipping off the U.S. East Coast. You would have thought that the U.S. would have been prepared as we saw the war coming and had actually already been doing anti-submarine duty while escorting convoys as part of the Pan-American Security Zone. While U.S. ships did not attack U-boats inside the security zone, they broadcast all U-boat sightings, thus alerting British and Canadian ships. But the U.S. was not prepared. The Navy had a severe shortage of suitable convoy escort ships, and the Army Air Corps had a lack of planes for U-boat patrols. The U.S. didn't have a convoy strategy for coastal ships, as convoys were seen as even more risky without escorts. We didn't have a blackout protocol, afraid that that would harm tourist commerce in coastal cities and panic the population. 
The U.S. coast, especially the outer banks, were prime grounds for U-boats, allowing U-boats to submerge in deep water during the day and only come into the shallow coastal waters at night. Hundreds of Allied merchant ships and millions of tons of shipping were sunk in the first year of the war. The Germans referred to the time as the Happy Time and the Great American Turkey Shoot. The CAP offered an opportunity. Civil aviators could fly coastal patrols and radio when they encountered U-boats. They would not be armed, but their warnings could assist ships and vector military aircraft to the U-boats. In March of 1942, the coastal patrols began, flying from locations in New Jersey and Delaware, and the CAP was, essentially, given 90 days to prove its worth. They did so quickly. On March 10, 1942, First Lieutenant Eddie Edmonds became, reportedly, the first of the sub-chasers of the coastal patrol to spot a U-boat. Flying out of a base at Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, he radioed the U-boat's position to the Navy. But he didn't need to, as the U-boat, not knowing that his plane was not armed, crash-dived and went out to sea, where it was less danger to shipping. CAP flew patrols from dawn until dusk, using a variety of aircraft, all painted yellow and red, with a CAP emblem and outfitted with radios that let them interact with the Navy, Army, and Coast Guard. They mostly flew privately owned planes, like the Fairchild 24 or the Stinson 10A that were leased by the government, usually for a dollar a year. The only requirement was that the plane have at least a 90 horsepower engine. Other CAP volunteers maintained the aircraft and operated as ground crews. Many were either above or below draft age and often were flying their own airplanes. In addition, the Civil Air Patrol accepted men and women equally, offering a unique opportunity for women to be a part of the war effort. Eventually, the Civil Air Patrol operated 21 subchaser bases in 13 states covering the U.S. Eastern Seaboard and the Gulf of Mexico. The following May, CAP pilot Thomas Manning and observer Doc Rinker observed a U-boat off the coast of Florida. The sub saw them and died, but the water was shallow and the sub got stuck on a sandbar. The CAP crew radioed for assistance, but neither the closest Army Air Force's training base nor the closest Naval Air Station had any bombs. They circled the stuck sub for over half an hour, but by the time Army planes finally arrived, the sub had freed itself and escaped. After that, CAP planes were authorized to carry bombs and depth charges. Even the smaller planes were outfitted with 100-pound bombs. The first confirmed U-boat kill by the CAP was in July, when Captain Johnny Haggins and Major Wendt Farr, flying in a Grumman W-44, shadowed a U-boat that had been sighted by another CAP plane for nearly three hours before it finally came to periscope death. They charged and dropped both their depth charges, sinking the U-boat. The work was dangerous, flying in all sorts of weather at times when even the military aircraft wouldn't fly. Lieutenant Ed Phipps recalls that he was escorting a tanker and returned to base low on fuel when he flew into a fog bank in whiteout conditions. He escaped the fog but was nearly out of fuel. He got permission to land at a nearby naval air station, but landed four hours and ten minutes into his four hours worth of fuel. We must have landed on fumes, he said. A particularly harrowing example came on July 21, 1942. A Civil Air Patrol plane piloted by Henry Cross with observer and radio man Charles Shelfus crashed into the Atlantic 20 miles off Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Cross woke up, injured, in the water. The plane had sunk and Shelfus was missing. Base Commander Hugh Sharp, along with Eddie Edmonds, came to the rescue in a small Sikorsky S-36 seaplane, risking their lives landing in the 6-8 to eight foot swells. They got Cross aboard, but the swells were too high to take off. They had to taxi back on the water. But the left pontoon was damaged and started filling with water, threatening to tip over the flying boat. Edmonds climbed out on the other side and rode on the right pontoon, holding onto the bomb rack to balance the plane. He rode for nearly two hours in the freezing cold, often getting totally immersed in swells, before a Coast Guard vessel found them and towed them to shore. Cross survived, but Charles Shelfus was never found. He was one of the 62 members of the Civil Air Patrol who died serving with the CAP during the Second World War. Ninety aircraft of the CAP Coastal Patrol were lost at sea. Sharp and Edwards were among the first Civil Air Patrol members to be awarded the Air Medal for Meritorious Service for risking their lives in the rescue. Sharp later said, Of course I was honored to receive the medal, but I was also so impressed with FDR. By the end of the war, more than 800 CAP personnel were awarded Air Medals. The Coastal Patrol operated for 18 months, from March of 1942 to August of 1943. By then, the U-boats had largely been removed from U.S. coasts, and Navy and Army resources to fight the U-boat menace had grown. In that time, they reported 173 U-boats, attacked 57, and had two confirmed U-boat kills. The role that they played as a deterrent, keeping the U-boats farther out to sea, was likely significant. 
Later, German naval officers cited the damn red and yellow airplanes as part of the reason that they withdrew U-boats from U.S. coastal waters. CAP pilots of the Coastal Patrol also reported 177 ships in distress and helped to save hundreds of survivors of U-boat attacks. The Coastal Patrol flew nearly 87,000 missions in its 18 months of service. Extraordinary for a volunteer organization comprised of unpaid civilians. In addition to the Coastal Patrol, the CAP performed other services during the war. They flew courier missions, patrolled the southern border, flew search and rescue missions, helped fight forest fires, and towed aerial targets. In one of their more unique roles, they flew wolf patrol missions in the southwest to help reduce populations of wolves that were impacting beef production. In 2014, by an act of Congress, the Civil Air Patrol was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for its service during the Second World War. Following the war in 1946, the Civil Air Patrol was officially chartered as a purely benevolent organization, meaning that their planes would no longer be armed. And in 1948, they were made the, officially the civilian auxiliary of the newly created United States Air Force. Today, the purely volunteer organization performs several functions, including search and rescue, disaster relief, aerospace education for the general public, and they operate cadet programs for teenage youth. The contributions of the Civil Air Patrol during the Second World War were exceptional. They were unique for a voluntary civilian organization. And the reason that I collect the sort of memorabilia that I do is because I think that such service and such people deserve to be remembered. I'm the History Guy, and as always, thank you for your patronage. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>